Okay. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I spent way too many years in the classroom beginning things when the last bell rings, and so it's a little hard for me to adjust to the fact that there's not a bell here to tell me it's time to begin, but that's okay. Uh, I do believe we need to begin and end on time, and I definitely want to begin my remarks on time so that we leave as much time as possible for our featured speaker this morning. It is absolutely delightful uh, to me to watch this thing come together and to be here today with you. I know all of your names in print, and now it's just totally delightful to put your name and your face together and see you here with us today. I'm overwhelmed with the turnout. Uh, as so often happens with school districts. A week ago, there were about half of you were coming, and so it's been quite a delight in the last week and a little stressful in the last week to add so many of you to the group, and we truly appreciate your attendance. We call ourselves mochi, which isn't just my favorite term. It turns out, as you might have noticed, we can't use M-O-C-H-E as our domain name for our website because it's some indigenous tribe in Central America that already has the letters or something. So, I don't know, I was thinking, how do I say, you know, welcome citizens of Mochi? And I thought, no, maybe we're welcome to citizens of the Missouri Kingdom of Cleo or something. I kind of like that better. Uh, I need to say thanks to a number of people, but I won't be long about that because I do not believe that someone like myself should take up a lot of time because we, you came to hear the featured speaker, not to hear me. So in your program, we put a, about half of them are green and about half of them are white, you know, how the green runs out under the copy tray. Uh, but first we have corrections and additions to the program. And happily, you all navigated the first correction. Originally in the program, it showed that David was speaking from 10.30 to 12.30 in, at lunch. And that was definitely an error. And I think it was a little shocking when he discovered that that's what we had in print. Uh, so there are some corrections. There are additions. We have a number of exhibitors. And we're just totally delighted to have them here. You've already enjoyed their company and begun to look at the products and services they have available. And they'll be there throughout the break time uh, for both days. So please pay some attention to that. There are logistics then below that. You'll be handed an evaluation form on your way out of this session. We'll ask you to turn it in on your way out of the building today. Assuming you're back tomorrow, we have another form. We're actually collecting conference evaluations both days so that we can maximize the turn-in rate. These are very, very helpful to us for planning our next conference. I truly believe they get better every year because of your help and your comments. They're also extremely important to us when we ask people to help fund the event. When I can send to them your comments that suggest this was a worthwhile use of your time and school district's money and foundation money, et cetera, it helps a lot in terms of getting funding support so we can keep the cost of a conference like this at a reasonable rate. There will be door prizes at lunch both days, and when we discuss this, people quickly observe you have two chances to win a door prize. Uh, there is parking reimbursement for those of you who show your garage ticket to the people at the desk on your way out when you turn in your evaluation form. Uh, your name badges. If you're coming back tomorrow, be sure you are wearing your name badge so the security people see that you are coming back in legitimately and have already been checked in properly once. Also, if you're going to the old courthouse this afternoon for the conference reception, you need your name badge. We are happy to provide food and beverage for you. We would like not to provide food and beverage for anyone else who wanders in. So please have your name badge when you show up at the, <clears throat> at the reception this afternoon. Most of the members of the Missouri Council for History Education Board of Directors are here today. I would like them to stand, please, so we can say thank you for all their work in helping to make this conference possible. I'm seeing Gary McKitty, Pam Sanfilippo, Ted Green, Sheila Anuska, Nancy Schneider, Deborah Acton, Phil Shane, Flannery Burke, Tim O'Neill, and Wendy Blanton back there. Uh, if you have comments and would like to uh, talk with them about 
This conference and future conferences, we value your input and your support. We definitely need to thank the Missouri Humanities Council. They provide significant funding for conferences, most importantly providing scholarships for those of you who come from school districts who are unable and or unwilling to provide the registration fee and in some cases the lodging, and we are totally grateful to them for their support. In addition, we have other people whose support is very important. Up here in front is Mike Rigoli from the Organization of American Historians. Uh, you can notice the blue bags you're carrying around and see a major contribution from the OAH. Inside your bags, you have a complimentary copy of the a magazine of history put out by the OAH. I've been a subscriber for as long as I can remember and have found that extraordinarily valuable and appreciate that contribution to our conference. The venue, absolutely high class. It makes us feel like such important people. And for that, we are grateful. Mary Souter in the back of the room. Mary? director at the Economics Education Department here who helps make this facility available to us for this conference. And we are totally, totally, totally in her debt. Uh, I don't see Carmen around, but you'll see Carmen around in, she's wearing a white jacket today who does all the organizing and uh, facilitating. She is phenomenal, okay. So uh, special thanks to those folks. You'll see other thank yous on the page inserted. If you turn over that logistics page to the back, please pay attention to all the people who have made this possible. Uh, it's just phenomenal how people are willing to help. And I believe it is because there is still, happily, a wonderful cadre of people out there in this world who believe that history education is important and vital and wants to help make history education in Missouri and Illinois schools better. Shifting gears. I have heard Dr. Wheelock speak on this subject before. I was just mesmerized by his information and what he had to offer, absolutely blown away when Mary Souter said to us, and we can make David Wheelock available to you as a featured speaker. And I said, yes, go for it. Um, he's speaking in part on one of my favorite units, topics in history, which is the Great Depression, which is something that I've always found fascinating and I absolutely know why. My parents were Kansas farmers of the Great Depression, and I grew up truly understanding that events in history that we teach about affected real people in real ways. And that's something that's often lost on kids in the classroom. Dr. Wheelock is Vice President and Deputy Director of Research here at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, where he has been employed since 1993. Before joining the Federal Reserve, Dr. Wheelock was on the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin and a visiting scholar here at the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. He has published numerous articles on banking and monetary policy issues in academic journals and Federal Reserve publications, including a number of articles on the Great Depression. In addition, he is the author of The Strategy and Consistency of Federal Reserve Monetary Policy, 1924 to 1933, published by the Cambridge University Press. Dr. Wheelock served as the economic advisor on the team that developed the St. Louis Federal Reserve's Great Depression curriculum. I've used le I have used lessons from that curriculum. If you have not used it yet, uh, I think you would find it a very, very valuable classroom resource. He often speaks to educators who participate in economic education programs at the St. Louis Federal Reserve, and he has received his bachelor's degree from Iowa State University, his master's and PhD from the University of Illinois. It is with great pleasure that I make take this opportunity to present to you David Wheelock, who will talk about the Great Depression and current economic issues. Dr. Wheeler. Good morning. I'd like to also extend my welcome to you. Uh, we at the St. Louis Fed have been excited for more than a year knowing that your group is going to be uh, coming and visiting us and, and uh, spending a couple of days uh, with your conference here. So we're really delighted to have you and uh, hope you enjoy your visit to the St. Louis Bank. Um, as Joan said, I will be talking about the Great Depression, but in a, in a somewhat different format than, than is typically the case. Uh, 
when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois, I was a student of uh, Professor Larry Neal, who's an economic historian. He's written a lot about financial crises throughout history, the Mississippi bubble, the South Sea bubble, the, uh, the various, uh, the, the uh, French Revolution and how that affected the world. And he would teach uh, financial history courses. And one year I was his teaching assistant. And he tried an experiment, which was at least an experiment for him, which was to teach the course backward. In other words, start at the present and work back in, into his, and see how far back he got. Every history class I'd ever taken as an undergraduate up to that point it always started at some point and you know, gone up as far as you could go and then kind of petered out at the end of the semester. And that was typically you know, the Civil War or maybe you get up to the 1930s, you never get beyond that. But I thought that was kind of a clever thing. So when I got to the University of Texas and was an assistant professor there, I also had my own uh, financial history class. And one time I tried a similar experiment where I would start with a current economic problem, discuss it, and then go back and look at historical parallels or similar episodes in the past. Uh, I was at Texas in the late 80s. That was during the, the big SNL crisis. And it was after the oil prices had declined in Texas, and Texas at that time was not a very diversified economy. That wiped out all the savings and loans and banks that were in Texas, and it was a big crisis that there was something that the, the kids I was talking to could, could get their hands around. They, they sort of had an idea of what that was about. Well, I took the current crisis, the SNL crisis, and then went back and looked at previous episodes, the Great Depression being a principal one, where there were similar wipeouts of the banking system, we talked about you know, similarities and differences. You know, we have deposit insurance now, so the fact that my, uh, my bank was failing, I didn't really care, because I knew that the FDIC was there to, to bail me out when the, when the bank failed, and indeed it did. But you know, I mentioned that to my mother, who was a little girl during the Depression, and she thought I was crazy to keep my money in a bank that was on shaky ground, you know, because she had seen her, her parents lose their savings in a bank that had failed in the Great Depression when there was no federal deposit insurance. So you know, kind of doing that history in reverse uh, was, was kind of a unique experience. I did it one time. I left Texas. I came here. And, and since then, I've uh, been doing other things. But, uh, I want to try to revive that methodology today because in the last two or three years, we've lived through a similar uh, period of severe financial and economic distress. And so I want to talk about what's been going on in the United States really since early 2007 and then relate that back to and compare it with our experience from the Great Depression. So looking back through the lens of history, I want to look at, ask a few questions. What just what happened in the financial system and the economic, uh, economic system of our country? 2007 to 2009 was the period of the financial crisis and the recession. Since then, we've had a, a recovery of sorts of our economy, but it's been very slow. It's been an unusually weak recovery of our economy. The unemployment rate remains exceptionally high. And so, you know, there are important questions. Why has the recovery period been so weak? Well, to try to get some, some perspective on that, I will go back and make some comparisons with the economy in 1929 to 33, which is the downswing, the contraction phase of the Great Depression. The recovery phase began in 1933 and really continued up into World War II. And so the question is, are there lessons from the Great Depression experience which are useful for understanding what we've been going through in the last three or four years in the United States? Uh, I'm required, not exactly by law, but by custom at least, to uh, remind you that everything I say today is, is <laughs> if not completely off the record, it's, it's my own views and are not necessarily representative of, of official positions of the bank or of uh, Ben Bernanke or anybody else in the Federal Reserve System. So. Although Ben agrees with me on this. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about the financial crisis. I don't have to dwell on it very long because, of course, it's a pretty simple event to understand, not very complicated at all. <laughs> Just a few moving parts, and you can quickly understand what happened during the financial crisis. Obviously, it was a pretty, pretty complicated thing. It even was complicated for some really smart people. And, Chairman Bernanke is a really smart guy. I don't know, uh, you know, I've only met him a couple of times, but he's really scary smart. I mean, he's 
I think we've been lucky to have him in the position he's been in the last few years. He's been taking an awful lot of heat from both sides of the political spectrum, all, all sides of the pol political spectrum. Uh, you may not always agree with all of his policies, but I think he's always had the country's interests first and foremost in mind, and, and is really a, a man of integrity as well as, as great intellect. So let me talk a little bit about the, the recent financial crisis and, and the recession. It's, it's clearly been quite a train wreck. Uh, so is undoubtedly the worst financial crisis in the United States since the Great Depression. It resulted in a very severe recession, the worst recession we've had since the 1930s. But I'll put it in a little bit of context. It was not nearly as bad as what our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents went through during the 1930s. One reason is the current recession has not been as bad, I believe, is because our monetary and fiscal policies have been much more aggressive in trying to respond first to the crisis and then uh, to, to bring about a recovery from the recession. And in part, that's because they've, Chairman Bernanke and others have been students of the Great Depression and have you know, taken that to heart. And then I've, lastly, as I say, I want to address this question, why has the recovery been so weak? You know, there are, again, some parallels with the recovery from the Great Depression. So we've got a lot of ground to cover here in the next 45 minutes. I'm happy to be interrupted with a, a few questions. There will be another session at 1230. Uh, for those of you who want to explore this in more depth, I'll, I don't have any prepared remarks at 1230, but I'll just be there to answer questions or to you know, help with discussion or whatever. That's just one of your optional sessions at 1230. But, so I want to kind of give the overview in the next 45 minutes. Again, occasional interrupting questions are fine. Um, so maybe I don't, I'm not quite sure how much material I've got vis-a-vis -vis my hour. I will say, though, if you do want to ask a question, I've been asked to remind you to, to flip on the microphone switch in front of you because they are recording this presentation and want to capture the questions on the, on the uh, tape as well as the, as the answers. So flip on the microphone if you do have a question. Okay. So let me talk a little bit. We're, we're now current events or reasonably current events. And I'll just give you a quick timeline of, of how the, the financial crisis not the recession, but the financial crisis unfolded. We as policymakers, at least in our bank, were starting to, to see this show up in August of 2007. There was some major banks were starting to take losses on their subprime home mortgages in early 2007, but that didn't really show up in the financial markets until August of 2007, when banks started charging more to each other. Banks have uh, a lot of overnight loans with one another. They usually are at a very low interest rate, almost the same as the Treasury rate. We started seeing spikes in those rates, and we knew something was going on. Things kind of seemed like they settled down for a while. You know, you know, it didn't seem like it was too bad. But then in March of 2008, we had another shock. We had the failure of the Bear Stearns & Company, or the near failure of Bear Stearns & Company. They would have failed, and so what, what happened there, Bear Stern was a major investment bank in the United States. They relied on short-term loans they received from other banks and other major financial players to fund their portfolios of subprime, subprime mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. Well, uh, the major players started thinking that Bear Stearns just isn't good for, their, for these loans, and they stopped lending Bear Stearns money so Bear Stearns was unable to fund its portfolio of subprime debt. And so the Fed helped arrange a merger of Bear Stearns with J.P. Morgan, a much stronger financial institution. The Fed kicked in a $30 billion loan to J.P. Morgan to, to basically help underwrite that and allow the acquisition of, of Bear Stearns. But that was another shock, and, and uh, you know, it was controversial at the time. Things kind of settled down a little bit, but then the heat picked up again in the summer, September 7th was an important date because that's when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were taken into government conservatorship. That is, the, the U.S. government took them over, basically. Every, you know, so many people in the country and the world thought that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were government organizations. But in fact, they were private corporations with private shareholders. But they had this ability to borrow money at close to the government rate because there was this an implicit understanding that the Treasury was always there to bail them out if they got into trouble. And in fact, it turned out to be true. The Treasury bailed them out and has been bailing them out ever since. But the government had to step in and take over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or they would have collapsed. Those two organizations 
fund something like 90% of the home mortgages in the United States. Individual lenders make the, make the mortgage loans, and then they sell them, turn around and sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are these trillion dollar organizations that clearly were too big to allow to fail. So the government simply took them over and placed them into conservatorship, and they've been sitting there ever since. And then a week later, there was another major shock to the financial system with the failure of Lehman Brothers. Like Bear Stearns, Lehman was a big investment bank that had invested in a portfolio of dicey subprime mortgages and mortgage-backed securities and all these, these CDOs and CMOs and all these other uh, labels and, and hybrid securities that, that almost nobody had ever heard of up to that point. It was, a, it was a great financial mess. The Fed looked at Lehman Brothers. Barclays Bank was interested in perhaps taking over Lehman. They wouldn't do it without a substantial uh, infusion of cash from either the federal government or the Fed. The Fed, by law, said, you know, Lehman is too sick. We can't make a loan to, to bail him out. So Lehman was forced to file bankruptcy. But then the financial system started to collapse around us when that happened. The very next day, money market mutual fund investors, and I'm sure many of you have uh, savings in money market mutual funds, started withdrawing their money in, in rapid succession out of money market mutual funds because one of the money market mutual funds, one of them named Reserve Primary Fund, broke the buck. Reserve Primary Fund had invested in a lot of Lehman Brothers debt. And when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, the Reserve Primary Fund's assets themselves were called into question, and they could no longer maintain this $1 per share uh, value of the in essence, deposits that people like you and me had made with them. So they could say, well, your, your money is no longer worth, your shares are no longer worth one dollar, they're only worth 90 cents or something. Well, a lot of people didn't like that, and they started withdrawing money out of all money market mutual funds, not just reserve primary. So there's a classic run on these, these mutual funds. Very much like the Great Depression, when our grandparents were running on their commercial banks to withdraw their their checking account balances and their savings account balances because they feared that if they waited till tomorrow, the, the bank would be out of business. So they better get it today. And so we have these runs on these money market mutual funds. The money market mutual funds are important because they fund a lot of the commercial paper market, a lot of corporate debt, uh, 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 the large certificates of deposits issued by banks from throughout the world. So they're an important part of the financial system. And so it was, it was a, a very scary time there when you had these runs on these mutual funds. And then you had the collapse of the giant insurance company, AIG. AIG was, had been a classic traditional insurance company, automobile insurance, life insurance, property insurance, and so forth. But they had gotten very heavily involved in credit default insurance as well, and they had underwritten huge billions of dollars of contracts essentially insuring subprime mortgages and mortgage portfolios. And when those mortgages started going down the tubes, all of a sudden AIG was uh, you know, also going to be on the hook for billions and billions of dollars, which they simply didn't have. Like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they had grown so enormous that it would have been calamitous to allow <coughs> such an organization to fail. We would have had a massive financial crisis worldwide on the scale uh, greater than what we saw during the Great Depression. So the Fed, along with the Treasury Department, made enormous loans to AIG to keep them afloat and uh, re replace the management of the organization. And you know, it's, that's still an ongoing uh, mess. And uh, the AIG company has paid back a lot of these loans, but uh, uh, not all of them. So anyway, this is the kind of the history of the financial crisis in a nutshell from the beginning ripples of the crisis to, to increasingly severe shocks along the way. And so it's not surprising, really, that we got a, a, a significant recession out of that. But you can sort of trace the history of the crisis by looking at interest rates. What I plotted here is the difference between a short-term rate, the three-month LIBOR, the London Interbank Offering Rate, which is simply the interest rate that is that essentially the benchmark rate on loans between the largest commercial banks in the world. So you and I don't borrow at LIBOR, but Bank America borrows at LIBOR, and Citibank borrows at LIBOR, and JP Morgan borrows at LIBOR. 
you know, with, when they're making short-term loans with each other. Normally, LIBOR is very low relative to the three-month Treasury bill yield. So this is a yield spread here, if you will, the difference between the LIBOR interest rate and the three-month Treasury uh, treasury bill yield. So usually that's almost zero. In other words, most of the giant banks in the world can borrow money at essentially the same rate that the U.S. Treasury can borrow money at most of the time. But beginning in August 2007, they no longer could do that. We saw spikes occurring when these banks started taking losses on subprime and banks started getting worried about who they were lending to, even to each other. And so things kind of calmed down, but then we had ripples in December. And then March 2008 again was when Bear Stearns collapsed. That kind of got smoothed over with the Fed loan and, and J.P. Morgan taking over uh, Bear Stearns. Things calmed down into the summer, but then things really came to a boil when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac ceased to be viable concerns. Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. You had the runs on the money market funds. You had the commercial paper market essentially drying up. You had enormous spikes in these rates, huge spreads between what banks were borrowing uh, on loans to each other relative to uh, the safe, risk-free rate on the treasuries. So a lot of activity. And then as the crisis subsided, these rates started coming down again. And so, you know, into 2009, 2010, as the crisis abated, banks were back to borrowing essentially at the same interest rate that the U.S. Treasury can. This little blip here in June of last year is around the, uh, the first appearance of the Greek problems. The, the, the European debt crisis started heating up, uh, particularly with uh, the problems that Greece may not be able to repay its debts. And so you got some ripples going on in the market there. But you know, even despite as, as significant as the problems have been in Europe, we haven't seen anything, at least not yet, on the scale that we saw during the, the crisis here in the United States in 2007 and 2008. We also saw the crisis, of course, in our stock market portfolios, our 401ks and our retirement savings uh, thrift plans and so forth. As the crisis got worse and worse and worse, the stock market you know, just tanked. We all remember you know, in around March of 2009 you know, when the market was, was, had collapsed. It has since come back quite a bit, um, but you know, it's not, still not returned to the level of where it had been before the crisis. Okay, so now let's talk about the subsequent recession. That's, that's kind of the timeline of the financial crisis if it's not the, the nuts and bolts of everything that went on during the crisis, which in and of itself would you know, be a semester's worth of classes. So let's talk about the recession, but let's do it in a comparative sense. First, I want to compare it with recessions that we ourselves have lived through, and then I will, after that, compare it with the Great Depression. So here I've plotted some data on GDP, gross domestic product, which is the broadest measure of goods and services produced by the American economy. So it's adding everything up from haircuts to automobiles to jet aircraft. In dollars terms, you get GDP, the nation's output. During a recession, if you think of GDP as like a balloon, G GDP shrinks, air is let out of the balloon and GDP shrinks. We're producing less today than we did yesterday. During normal times, our economy is expanding and that balloon is continually expanding. During a recession, it's shrinking. Now, how much does it shrink? Well, during a typical recession, and what I've done here is plot the average post-war recessions up through the recession that began in 1990. That's the yellow line. And so during the typical recession, if we start the recession, we just set that the value of GDP equal to 100 at the beginning of the recession, GDP usually drops two or three percentage points. So if we were producing 100 last year, this year we're producing 97. Okay, so about a 3% decline in GDP before the economy starts to right itself and the recovery begins. And usually within about five quarters after the beginning of the recession, we're out of it. We've cleared and now we're back to producing and the economy is expanding and, we're, and our, our balloon is expanding. We're producing more than we did not only during the recession but before the recession began. So that's the typical pattern of post-war recessions. Now we've had two recessions before the most recent one. There was a recession in 2001. That's the red line. That was a very minor recession as it turns out. GDP in the original data shrank a quarter or two but then it expanded. Since the data have been revised, it turns out there was actually no decline in GDP except 
maybe one quarter here. It never actually got below where it had been. But the growth was rather relatively slow after that recession. So it was a minor recession, but a rather slow recovery. We had a somewhat more serious recession in 1990-91. If you remember, there was a, an oil shock associated with the first Gulf War, uh, and that resulted in, in a, something of a recession. Uh, that is the green line here. Output shrank about 2%, but as was typically the case, after about five quarters, we were back to where we were in terms of GDP at the start of the recession. And then growth took off. Again, not, not at the average rate, a little bit slower than average, but not too far off the typical pattern. Well, the blue line here is, is the most recent recession, the recession that began in the fourth quarter of 2007. It didn't start off too badly. You know, the, the first six months or so of 2008 were not too bad. But after September of 2008, when we had the Lehman failure and the AIG collapse and the Fannie Freddie collapse, and you know, that's when things really got bad, not, not only for the financial system, but for the economy more broadly. And the economy really continued to sink. So even at five quarters, we were still in the trough here. So this was five, six quarters after the beginning of the recession was before we hit bottom. And we had lost, at, at that time, our economy was, GDP was about 95% of what it had been at the start of the recession. So whereas the typical recession loses maybe two percentage points off of GDP, this time we lost five, which is severe by post-war standards. There have only been one or two that are close to that in the post-war period. And then the recovery has been agonizingly slow. And it's, it's actually kind of slowed down of late. Here we are now some 15, 14, 15 quarters after the start of the recession in 2007, and our GDP is only now approaching the level it was in the fourth quarter of 2007. So we've had an unusually slow recovery. We see that in terms of output. We also see that in terms of employment. The typical pattern, again, is marked by the yellow line here. During a, a, a recession, we typically lose about 2% of jobs in the economy. So again, I've set total employment equal to an index number of 100 at the start of the recession. As we go through the recession, about 12 months after the beginning of the recession, of the typical recession, we're at the bottom, where we have employment about 98% of where it had been at the start of the recession. And then we get a recovery. And within 24 months after the start of the recession, our economy is now producing more jobs than we had even before the recession began. Now, the last two recessions, the 1991 and 2001 recessions, we lost about the typical number of jobs, but we just we had very slow recoveries. They were referred to as jobless recoveries, because even though GDP was expanding, employment was not, or not very fast. So, for example, after the 2001 recession, we were still 24, well, more than 24 months past the start of the recession, and employment was below where it was at the beginning of the recession. It took almost 48 months before total employment in the United States was back to where it had been at the start of the recession. So that was a long time to get employment back up. Well, the blue, again, is what we're experiencing now. We lost a lot more jobs during this re recession. About 6% of jobs were lost as compared to two in the typical case. And we've gained very few of those jobs back which explains why the unemployment rate is 9.1% today as compared to 5% when we entered the recession. So the economy's slowly been expanding. Job growth has been growing a little bit, but, but it's painfully slow. And I, you know, uh, one of the big areas of losses, unfortunately, has been in the, in the ranks of our school districts and our state and local governments. Uh, there you know, obviously been a lot of layoffs there. Also, uh, but, but not just in the public sector, a lot of private sector jobs have been lost as well and have yet to come back. So that's, that's a characteristic of the most recent recession. Okay, so we've given that some context in terms of experiences that we're somewhat familiar with. Now let's go back and look at the context of the Great Depression. First table here are just comparing, again, GDP, length of the recession, the unemployment rate during the recession. I've also included the consumer price index here, the inflation rate, for some comparisons. During the recession of 2007 to 9, that recession lasted 18 months. We're still in recovery mode. We lost 
somewhat over more than 5% of, of GDP. The unemployment rate at its peak was 10.1%. It's still 9.1%. And we've had small growth in the consumer price index. Prices have, been, have continued to rise on average in the economy at about a 1.5% rate. Now let's contrast that with the Great Depression. That contraction phase lasted almost four years, from the peak in the summer of 1929 to the trough in the first quarter of 1933, nearly four years of collapsing economy. GDP fell by 36%. In other words, your, your balloon, think of it as a circumference of 100, is now shrunk down to a circumference of about 65. It's a tremendous lost output in the US economy before the economy started turning around. The unemployment rate, our peak in this most recent recession, 10%, unusually high. We've had only one other recession since World War II where the unemployment rate got above 10%, and that was in the early 80s. In the Great Depression, the unemployment rate was above 10% for an entire decade, the entire decade of the 30s. The unemployment rate maxed out in, in 1933 at 25%. My, my research assistant got a little bit too precise. I don't know where he came up with the 0.36 there. Just remember the 25%. And, you know, and of course, that doesn't capture the whole story either. So many people were employed as part-time or in jobs that you know, were, were kind of underemploying their skills. You know, I had two, my two grandfathers. One of them lost his job entirely during the Great Depression. The other one, uh, who had been a manager of a, of a gas plant, uh, you know, a, plant that takes natural gas and, and makes it ready for use as fuel in West Virginia, he had run the entire organization. Well, he was the only one left operating that plant. He was just kept on as a night watchman. So he, he did a little farming on the side and worked part-time as a night watchman, even though he was, had been the plant manager. Everyone else got laid off. So you know, he was still employed. He was not part of the 25%, but clearly it was not the job that he had been trained for or, or wanted. Uh, so he was underemployed at that point. So there was a lot of that going on as well. We also had massive deflation. That is the price level was shrinking. Not just prices of individual goods, but prices of all goods were going down. Now, on the surface, that sounds fine, you know, as long as your income is holding up. But in fact, people's incomes were falling at least as fast. Income is falling at the rate of 36%. Prices are falling at the rate of 27%. So even though the price of a loaf of bread has gone from 25 cents to a nickel. Most, many people didn't have a nickel. You know, so, there was, you know, so then the baker had trouble selling a loaf of bread at five cents. And so that was the, the situation that our economy, our forefathers were in. I've read an interesting book recently by a guy named Ted Gupp. He's, uh, I think he writes for the New Yorker or the New York Times. That he's, he's a freelance writer, but he, uh, he grew up in Canton, Ohio, and, uh, but his grandfather had been a businessman in Canton, Ohio. He had an interesting life history. But you know, he ran a clothing store, and he, he kept the job, you know, he kept his clothing store open during, throughout the 30s, and he had a little money. So in 1933, he put an ad in the local Canton newspaper where he would, uh, he said, you know, if you're down on your luck, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to give $5.00 you know, to people who write in with their story and, and, you know, need a little extra money now at Christmas time and so forth. And so this guy, Ted Gupp, had actually found the letters that had been written to his grandfather by people living in, in the Canton area who'd seen his ad in the newspaper asking, you know, you know, asking, you know, if you can find me a job, you know, I'd much rather have a job than, than your charity, but I've got kids who are who don't have shoes to wear to go to school, or you know, we, we have trouble putting food on the table. And so you know, he's, his grandfather would you know, get these letters and he would write them a check. He did this all anonymously. He didn't, uh, you know, it was all done. It, it's, it's a really interesting book. And you'll, you kind of get the, the personal stories about what a lot of people were going through. And some of these people had been very successful uh, business people, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, one guy was a painter, you know, he couldn't find any work painting, you know, and, other people you know, were, were down on their luck for other reasons. But uh, anyway, it's an it's a, it's a interesting book. Anyway, I digress. So let, you know, I showed you the, the diagrams now, previously showing GDP relative during the recent recession relative to what it had done during our prior post-war recessions. Now let's compare it with the Great Depression. Compared to the Great Depression, what we've lived through doesn't look nearly so bad. 
So the red line here is the recent recession. GDP lost about 5 6%. We're now back to about where we were at the start of the recession. Here's the Great Depression. Again, the 36% loss in GDP. Four years out, we're still at the bottom. Employment. We've had a terrible experience with employment in this recession. We lost an unusually large number of jobs, and those jobs have been very slow to come back. Here's the Great Depression. Lost 25% of people were thrown out of work. And it was not really until we turned the corner starting in 1933, started getting some em employment growth. But it was, again, it was World War II before the unemployment rate fell below 10%. The price level. As I mentioned that during this most recent recession, prices in general have tended to continue to rise. Now, of course, we've seen it at the gas pump where prices have gone up and they go down and they go up and go down. But generally, they've been rising. But other prices have come down. You know, the prices of cell phones and iPads have continued to fall. So on average is what we're capturing with the inflation rate. On average, the level of prices in the, in the US economy has been growing at a, at a, at a pretty steady 1.5%, which is a, a roughly equivalent of, of price stability measured by the Consumer Price Index. We had tremendous deflation during the Great Depression, however. Prices everywhere were falling. And again, it was not until the mid-30s before that started to turn around. And that turns out to be an important difference, and I think an important reason why the Great Depression was so great relative to even what we have experienced recently. It's that deflation aspect of it. So let's talk about the government's response. The Fed responded much more aggressively in the 2007 to 9 period than did the Fed in the 1930s. The Fed set up special credit programs for banks and other financial firms. It cut interest rates, cut our own federal funds interest rate target that, that we have a lot of influence on. That's been cut to zero now for two years. Um, we've been engaged in this QE policy, quantitative easing, buying lots of government bonds, putting them on our balance sheet, and that pumps money into the economy. So, you know, to keep the economy moving as much as we can. Uh, there's the famous or infamous TARP, the 700 billion TARP that Congress fought about in, uh, in the fall of 2008 that uh, the Congress eventually passed and President Bush signed into law. Uh, that helped recapitalize our banking system. It kept it afloat. Uh, money market mutual funds I mentioned. Well, the Treasury stepped in with a temporary guarantee program to help discourage people from withdrawing their money out of the money market mutual funds. Very much like FDIC insurance for our bank accounts. Uh, the FDIC insurance was expanded from a $100,000 limit up to $250,000 to cover more people. Uh, again, to, to strengthen our banking system. We had the stress tests where the largest banks in the country uh, were given special examinations by the Fed and the other banking agencies to make sure that they were in sound condition. If they weren't, they were required to, to put additional capital into their organizations. We had the Dodd-Frank Act that was passed last, uh, last summer, 2010, which uh, if, imposes a lot of new regulations on the banking system and on, on mortgage brokers and so forth. But a mixed bag, but that, that's something that uh, was a response by the government. So I mentioned the Fed has cut interest rates to zero. We did that in December of 2008. We've kept them at zero ever since then. Extremely accommodative monetary policy. This chart is a chart of the Fed's balance sheet, specifically the assets held by the Fed. So here in the fall of 2008, the Fed's balance sheet size had basically been, been constant, and actually growing slightly over time, but it on this scale, it shows it as constant. But then beginning when the big crisis hit in the fall of 2008, we had a lot of emergency lending programs. Since then, we've been buying government bonds and, and mortgage bonds issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That's been pumping cash into the economy. And all of that has served to keep the money supply growing. The M2 is the broad measure of the money supply that includes not only cash and coins in your pocket, but also your checking accounts and your savings accounts at banks. So that money supply has continued to rise. That's the blue line here. The monetary base consists of currency in circulation plus the reserves that commercial banks are holding at the Fed, at the Federal Reserve. So that is a more uh, narrower measure of, of what the Fed is doing to put liquidity into the economy. 
So the Fed increases the monetary base by buying government bonds, by making loans to, to banks, and that in turn results, keeps the broader money supply going up. That was very different during the Great Depression. In the 1930s, the money supply collapsed, even though the monetary base, that is currency in circulation plus bank reserve deposits, were rising. So that's a, that's a, 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 a contrast between the 30s and the present, which again, I think, is important to understanding why our recent experience, as bad as it was, was not as severe as the Great Depression. So uh, this is just reiterating, summarizing what I've already said in terms of what the Fed did uh, this time around. Now let's talk about what the Fed dur dur did during the Great Depression. This, by the way, is the New York Stock Exchange. I just grabbed a Great Depression picture. Uh, so OK, so we had the stock market crash in October 1929, big, massive event, and a big Fed response. The Fed uh, increased the money supply, uh, rescued uh, the, the, the stock broker companies and so forth. And so the stock market crash, per se, didn't turn out to be a big deal. But the Fed didn't follow through in going into the 1930s. In the early 1930s, there was a series of banking panics. So I described the events of people losing confidence in the money market mutual funds. The parallel was in the 30s. Again, no deposit insurance, no FDIC. If people started worrying about the safety of the deposits in, of their deposit in their bank, then the sensible thing is to go get that deposit out in the form of cash and you know, stuff it under your mattress or bury it in a coffee can in the backyard or do anything but keep it in a bank. Banks were not safe in the 1930s because so many of them were failing. They were going out of business. One day they were here, the next day the, the door would be shut and with it, your money was gone. Okay, so you're not going to keep your money in an institution like that. And so as a result, there were these panics where depositors would just line up and it, as soon as the, the doors open that morning, they go in and take all their money out. And in a fractional reserve banking system, which is the way banking systems operate, they never keep on hand as much cash in the vault as they do their deposit liabilities. So the bank may have a million dollars of deposits for its customers, but maybe only fifty or hundred thousand dollars of cash in the vault because they've lent the rest out essentially. You know, and so they they make money by lending out their customer deposits and then getting the the rate of return on those loans. Of course, the loans were going bad in the 30s because people didn't have the money to pay the loans back. Not just mortgages, but farm loans and car loans and everything else. So the banking system was, was collapsing. So people were running on these banks. And the Fed basically ignored it. I'll talk about why in a minute. The Federal Reserve credit, I showed you the balance sheet of the Fed jumping up like this in 2008 didn't do that in the 30s. It basically stayed flat. In fact, it contracted at the beginning stage of the Depression. The monetary base, that is currency in circulation, plus reserve deposits at the Fed, grew a little bit. The Fed supplied some cash to help accommodate the withdrawal demands of cash from banks. So the money monetary base grew, but that wasn't nearly fast enough to keep the, the money supply from growing. So here's the Fed's balance sheet, in essence. So we have these financial panics, these shocks hitting the banking system, starting with the stock market crash, then banking panics. When Great Britain went off the gold standard in the fall of, of uh, 1931, that caused speculation around the world that the US would be next to go off the gold standard. And that resulted in, in a lot of foreign withdrawals of gold from American banks. We were on the gold standard in those days. Dollars were convertible into gold. But if there was concern that we might go off the gold standard, then somebody who's holding dollars would not be able to get gold. And so there were uh, foreigners were pulling dollars out of American banks, converting them into gold, and getting them out of the country. And that was a shock that was, sh that was hitting the banking system. So what happened is the Fed this, the, the sum of the red portion here and the blue portion essentially is the, the amount of loans the Fed is making to the banking system plus our, the liquidity we're providing by buying securities, by buying government bonds. 
So when these shocks would occur, we'd, we, the Fed, increased their lending temporarily, but it would always shrink back down. In fact, it would often shrink back down to a level that was below where it had been before the shock. So on net, the Fed is actually contracting its balance sheet rather than expanding it. Now eventually, starting in 1931-32, the Fed starts to expand its balance sheet a bit, but it's very sluggish and not nearly enough to keep the money supply, which is the yellow line here, or the, the greenish yellow line, from collapsing, particularly following each of these shocks. So these, are, these vertical lines are those shocks I had on the previous, so it's just lining up the dates. Uh, the blue is the Fed, total Fed credit, that's our balance sheet. The red is the monetary base, and then the green is the money stock. So again, in, in the most recent episode, 2007, 2009, the money supply has continued to expand. Here, it's collapsing. And it's the falling money stock, the blue, which is explaining why the price level is falling, why we're having so much deflation in the economy. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that if you have a home loan and you're contracted to pay, say, $1,000 a month on your loan, principal and interest, and if your income is going down, it makes it a little tougher to pay that home loan, that, make that $1,000 payment. You know, that's, a, that's a classic debt deflation story. As prices are falling in the economy, as incomes are falling, it makes it harder to repay in, pay loans which are fixed in you know, a fixed dollar amount term. So had, that was a, a significant problem affecting households and businesses throughout the economy in the 30s. As prices were falling, as incomes were falling, it made it much more difficult to repay loans. And when the loans are not being repaid, that's less income for the lender, the banking system, so they're more apt to go out of business because you know, they're failing right and left. So they've got, on the one side of their balance sheet, their loans are not being repaid, so they have no income. And the other side of their balance sheet, depositors are coming in and wanting to take their, their deposits out in the form of cash. So because of all of this, about a third of the banks in the U.S. economy failed. Again, no deposit insurance. Why wasn't the Fed more aggressive doing about this? Why were they asleep on the bench? Well, one reason is because the Fed, Fed officials were misinterpreting monetary conditions. It's not that they didn't see banks failing all around, but they just didn't quite get the idea of why, what they should do about it. One reason was because interest rates were very low. Not unlike today, they were very low. But that doesn't necessarily mean that monetary conditions are loose or easy. If there's deflation in the economy, if incomes are shrinking, prices are shrinking, it's making the real cost of borrowing, the real interest rate, go up rather than down. And so here's a picture of the nominal interest rate. I just picked a, a short-term interest rate that, on business rate, a banker's acceptance rate. So that fell to very low levels. You know, if a business, a AAA borrower or the U.S. government could borrow at 1% or less in 1931, 32, 33. But because of deflation, the real cost of borrowing, the real interest rate, was rising significantly. So deflation makes the pain, if you will, of having a debt increase. Even if the, the nominal borrowing rate is going down on new loans in the economy, because your income is shrinking so fast, despite a lower interest rate, it's just much more expensive to borrow in the sense of what, how much you have to work, how much you have to produce, how much income you have to have in order to repay those loans. Another reason the Federal Reserve Act limited the Fed's ability to help only to banks that were members of the Federal Reserve System. Now, since 1980, all banks, all savings loans, all credit unions have access to the Fed's discount window. The Fed can make emergency loans to any depository institution. But before 1980, the Fed could only make direct loans to its member banks, which tended to be the larger banks located in larger cities. They were the ones, they were in better condition, generally, than the small banks, the community banks that were out in the smaller areas, the rural areas. They were the ones that were collapsing in, in, at a high rate. So 
even to the extent that the Fed recognized the problem, there was, they had a legal problem getting the cash out to the areas of the country that really needed it. And some people were concerned about speculation, financial speculation. This, again, there's some parallels here with the current situation. We saw the big housing boom, the bubble in house prices, the subprime mortgages, people getting loans with no money down or you know, not having to prove their income because banks were just throwing money at them. Okay? The same sort of stories were going on in the, in the 20s, both about mortgages but also about the stock market. There was a lot of concern about speculation in Wall Street and that the Fed had, had been too loose in the 20s, put out too much money and that caused the stock market run up and a lot of people saw the collapse of the stock market as being an important cause of the depression. If only because of the timing, you know, the, the crash happened and then there was a depression. So there, and there, and I'm not saying there wasn't a connection, but a lot of people saw that as a very tight connection between financial speculation in the 20s and the subsequent depression. So in the 30s, there was a lot of concern about not wanting to reignite that sort of speculative, speculative frenzy. And so there were people within the Fed who were concerned about doing that and didn't want to put out money when they saw it as not being needed and likely only to be funneled into reinflating Wall Street and not helping Main Street. So again, it's a, you know, honest disagreements about the efficacy of policy. Okay, so let's talk about lessons learned. Ben Bernanke in a, in a 90th anniversary party for Milton Friedman, the great monetarist economist who had written about the Great Depression and really blamed the Fed for causing the Great Depression, for allowing the money supply to fall, to allowing the bank panics to happen. Ben Bernanke at, at Friedman's 90th birthday party said, you know, we, we understand, Milton, you taught us We've learned those lessons and we won't let it happen again. And if there's anything about Ben Bernanke's tenure as Fed chairman, it's that he's trying his damnedest not to let it happen again. And so the Fed has been much more aggressive about responding to shocks in the financial system and trying to keep the economy expanding. Again, we've had all these new facilities, the rescues of Bear Stearns and AIG, the large expansion of the monetary base, which is keep the money supply growing. All those are different than the Fed's response in the 30s. And we've avoided this deflation problem that, that causes the real interest rate to go up and the cost of borrowing to be so painful. We've not avoided a great recession, but at least thus far, we've order, avoided a great depression. So now let's talk about the recovery. I've got four minutes left until lunch. <laughs> I haven't taken a single question. I had a little bit of a fear that maybe I'd put too much into this too many slides, but I couldn't help myself. I, a few years ago, uh, Mary's predecessor took me on a dog and pony show around the St. Louis Federal Reserve District to different cities in the, in the district, Memphis and Little Rock and so forth. And I did a whole day's worth of lectures on the Great Depression. So was, you know, I, I still didn't run out of material, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to cap, put it all into 45 minutes. But, uh, so, one end of the Great Depression, it took more than just ordinary monetary policy, it took a change in regime. And, I'll talk, and some of the things that, we, that changed when, when Roosevelt came in, he devalued the dollar in terms of the gold standard, he really radically changed the gold standard. Uh, other things, fortuitously, I guess, that were helping in Europe, uh, not least of which was the political problems going on in Europe, caused a flow of gold back into the United States, which helped reflate our money supply get our money supply expanding, get the price level back up. That brought down real interest rates, and that got consumers to start borrowing again. More importantly, it got businesses borrowing to invest in new plant, new equipment, and creating jobs. Now, what about the New Deal? Our history books tell us that Roosevelt ended the Great Depression by creating the New Deal, coming up with all these various programs to put people back to work and institute reform and so forth. Well, there's been a lot written about the New Deal, a lot written recently, and it's, you know, the conclusion is kind of it's a, it's a mixed bag, the New Deal. There were a lot of things created, there was a lot of experimentation, some of it worked. There were programs like the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which helped clear a million delinquent home mortgages off the books of lenders and refinance them. There was the refinance, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was like our TARP, it lent money and invested capital in the banking system to get the banking system restarted. The Civilian Conservation Corps employed 
thousands of, of young men, unemployed young men, to put them to work on civil works projects like you know, building parks and, and so forth. We see a lot of, of the, the work done by the Civilian Conservation Corps in our national parks today. Some programs of the New Deal, however, were harmful. The National Recovery Act. It encouraged big businesses to get together and form cartels to jack up prices. That made it harder for people to buy. It's not the way to solve a deflation problem is not by raising individual prices, it's by expanding the money supply and increasing demand. It's not by allowing cartels to form, allowing firms to fix prices. It also retarded growth and employment. Similarly, the Agricultural Adjustment Act was our first agricultural policy where we went in and paid, people, paid farmers not to grow. We paid them to slaughter their pigs. We paid them to leave their farm fields vacant. So even though we had people starving in the cities, we were paying farmers not to grow stuff or to kill their pigs all in the idea of, well, that will reduce supply and therefore raise prices. Well, it raised prices, but it didn't help feed people who were hungry. And it also threw a lot of farm labor out of work because they were no longer needed to, because we weren't growing as many crops. So that actually ended up releasing a lot of farm labor that ended up in cities, in slums, and so forth. So, you know, the, it's, a, it's a real mixed bag as to, uh, to what helps. So let me wrap up. What, you know, so, some lessons. Money matters. Monetary policy perspective, the Fed must respond aggressively to financial crises. It must resist deflation. We learned in the 1970s the, how pernicious inflation can be and how damaging for the economy it can be. In the 30s, we had learned how damaging deflation could be. So price stability is the most important objective for the Fed. If the Fed focuses on price stability, gets price stability right, then employment will follow. Output growth will follow, and so forth. But one of the problems is, and this is probably an inevitability, is that recessions that follow financial crises, particularly those involving the housing market, are always more severe, and their recoveries are always slower than ordinary garden variety recessions. So in some sense, it's, it's almost, no matter what we throw at it, it's going to be a slow recovery, simply because there's all these financial shocks that have to work through the system and, and get, get cleared before, uh, before we can have a vigorous recovery. So government policies can be a mixed bag. It's very difficult to design fiscal policies that are going to help. We had our big government spending program of last year, you know, which, again, was kind of a mixed bag. But we're still stuck in low gear in our economy. Does that mean we should? spend more now or cut taxes now. You know, it's, it's very hard to design fiscal policies that are going to do much in terms of getting the economy moving again. Unfortunately, that's a lesson that this is, uh, you know, it's, we're stuck with. But by going back and studying some of these programs from the 1930s and trying to figure out which ones were the ones that were successful or seemed to have been successful and which were the ones that seemed to be more harmful or not very successful, we can hopefully learn some things about how to design appropriate policies today. So, lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick around if you have any questions, but I also, yes, ma'am. You turn on your mic there. Um, I was wondering, um, with groups like African Americans, uh, different racial groups who probably wouldn't have had access to some of those programs that helped, what were the options for In those? In the 30s? Yeah. Yeah, that was really tough because, well, an example, I'm, I talked about the Agricultural Adjustment Act, paying, you know, there were a lot of African Americans em employed as laborers or as sharecroppers in, in southern uh, farms, and all of a sudden, you know, there was no, no work for them. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the African, communi African American community really suffered a lot in the 30s, and uh, a lot of the New Deal programs were, were uh, discriminatory uh, in the sense that, you know, only whites allowed, uh, and, and so that was a problem. Eleanor Roosevelt was a champion of, of minorities, and she really worked, she worked her husband over to try to integrate some of these uh, programs and, and bring them along. There were things like uh, housing programs uh, that were started, um, uh, what, I forget what the term is, but, you know, just, to public housing and so forth that uh, 
not that they were integrated, but there'd at least be, be some public housing for minorities and so forth. But it's, you know, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a happy uh, time, so. Anything else? Or, yes, sir. I understand one of the problems today is that there's still, banks are still very, very tight on credit. Can the Federal Reserve do anything about that? In other words, they've made the restrictions so tight that people who actually want to borrow money, have jobs, et cetera, <clears throat> yeah. cannot do so, even with a good credit rating and if they have a job. It's, it's, a, it's a real mixed bag, because if you talk to bankers, they say, well, there's no demand for loans, or at least there's no demand coming from people who are creditworthy borrowers, particularly when they're talking about business borrowers. You know, consumers, um, households, you know, you have collateral in the form of a car loan or a house or, or whatever, but business borrowers, a lot of that is not collateralized borrowing, and so sorting out the creditworthiness is difficult. Now, the Fed, um, of, of course, we've, we've provided banks with a lot of ammunition with which they could make loans. Uh, we also, I'm not a supervisor, but my understanding is, you know, we, we're, we're not going in and telling banks, you may not loan because we're worried about your health. You know, we, we encourage you to make good loans. We have programs that try to bring, uh, particularly community, in terms of our community affairs area, we bring borrowers and community groups together with lenders to try to, to facilitate, uh, you know, matching and, and helping uh, overcome some of the information problems. But clearly, this is an area that, you know, we had a period in the, up to, through 2007 where uh, bankers, on average, were probably too liberal. And so now we've gone through a period when they probably, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. And, you know, the, the, the surveys that we do suggest that lending standards have begun to ease over the last 12 months or so, but, but we're not nearly back to where we were. But, so, yes, sir. 